All right, well, I think we'll get started. It's really um, a huge pleasure for me to um, introduce Mark Gerson to you. Um, I, um, while I've known of his work for a long time, he and I have just started to work more closely together through one of the numerous consortia that he's uh, a member of, and it's been really uh, a huge pleasure. So um, Mark is very organized and, and makes this, this process of introducing him really quite uh, straightforward. I assume he or others keep his Wikipedia page quite quite up to date. So I know that he graduated, he's very smart, he graduated summa cum laude from, um, from Harvard and then went on to Cambridge to do uh, his PhD, followed that by a postdoc with um, Michael Levitt at Stanford. Um, and he's been, at, at least initially, um, you know, his, his uh, PhD and postdoctoral work was devoted more towards understanding protein structure and function. He's, a, he's like many, like many uh, uh, informatics trained people, has moved much more on to thinking about genomes and personal genomes and cancer and epigenetics. Um, he's critically involved in analyses of lots of large projects. Um, consortia has made, you know, major contributions to ENCODE, MOD ENCODE, 1,000 Genomes, writes prolifically on topics, mathematical genomics and of societal import. He's been elected a, um, a fellow of AAAS and the uh, International Society for Computational Biology. And I will uh, stop and let Mark uh, come up and give us uh, this uh, personal genomes talk that he has planned. Well, uh, thank, thank you. Oops, I have to press the button here. Sorry, just a second. Oops. Oh, there we go. I should be. The green light is on. I hope you can hear me now. Hello. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm on there. Well, I want to thank uh, Pamela for introducing me, and I should say I, I've enjoyed my uh, visit here uh, to, to Mount Sinai, and I, I really do enjoy uh, very much interacting with um, Pamela and other people here at uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, so today I'm going to uh, talk to you about um, aspects of uh, personal uh, genomics, um, in particular how one way to kind of think about dealing with all the large amount of data that we're getting uh, from this to prioritizing uh, variants. And so I thought I would just start off by talking about uh, data scale and, um, and so forth. So uh, you've probably all seen this uh, Moore's Law uh, before. This is the famous um, uh, sort of scaling law in the computer industry. This is actually the real clock that the computer industry runs to, quite literally. Uh, this doubling every few years in uh, the number of transistors per chip or the clock speeds. And this, of course, is the thing behind the amazing uh, rise of Silicon Valley and all the amazing things you have with computers and so forth. And this was originally um, coined by um, uh, Gordon Moore, who was one of the original uh, founders of Intel. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I think he realized this, and, and after he realized about this kind of exponential scaling, like I said, the whole industry kind of started to take this into account and really think in terms of um, working in a world with this scaling. Now, um, let me tell you a little bit more about um, Moore's Law, because as you'll see in a second, I think this is a, to some degree a paradigm for the world we're in, of course, in the big data world of um, uh, genomics and bioinformatics. So there's a few more things I'd like to say. First of all, Moore's Law is very related to another law that was created called Cryer's Law, which you probably haven't heard of as much. Uh, but it's a little closer to what we do. It has to do with the uh, exponential increase in the ability to store data. And Cryer was one of the early um, executives at this company called Seagate, which built a lot of disk drives. And so here's a picture of it. It also has an exponential increase. But one thing that's neat about Cryer's Law that you can see even better than Moore's Law is that actually Cryer's Law does, does not come from disk drives getting bigger and bigger and bigger every year, what it comes from is disk drives getting bigger and bigger, but then being superseded by a new technology. And so you, it's, what it is is this kind of um, superposition of many different S-curves. We have many different technologies coming in. So the consumer just sees a monolithic exponential increase, but the people on the inside see one technology superseding another and so forth. And I think. Um, to some degree, maybe you can sort of see where we're going. This, of course, to some degree is a match for what's going on in our field. Um, so, you know, this is the famous um, Moore's Law or exponential increase graph now for sequencing. And this is actually from the NHGRI um, website that tabulates this. 
And you probably all um, know what I'm going to tell you about now, how we had this uh, great increase in safety speed, and then we really shifted to new technologies. And that's, of course, the um, next-gen sequencing. And so, you know, after the genome was done, we had this kind of exponential increase with the current technology up to about 2007. And then, of course, we had this amazing um, advent of next-gen sequencing and the ability to sequence more and more. And essentially, we shifted, you can see, to a new S-curve. Um, and so forth. And so from the long view, we would probably have exponential increase, but there was a couple of years here uh, that it was really quite a uh, wild, wild ride. Um, so what is the, um, this Moore's Law in data production and um, also uh, uh, computation, what does it mean for us? Of course, it means that the, we are now in this world, as you all know, of big data. That's, I think, the title of this seminar series, actually, um, and you're probably all aware of the gargantuan amounts of data that are starting to be piled up. And so I just kind of graphed that here, but let me tell you a little bit about this. So here's the number of petabases in what's called the sequence read archive. I think one thing that's kind of interesting is the big thing happening of late is not so much the amount of data that's piling up, but it's um, the amount of private data, whereas the original genome sequencing was really about um, open uh, public data, and now more and more you see uh, large amounts of protected data, which really represents a new challenge in terms of access and, um, you know, how do we um, have all this uh, data but also still keep it private. And also, just to finish our technological discussion, you can see with the advent of uh, sequencing, you can see the amount of uh, data obviously coming from other technologies like microarrays falling, uh, falling off very much. And so this is a current picture of where we are in the sequencing uh, universe as of now. Um, this actually is from uh, Heidi Sophia and NHGRI who tabulates this. And the kind of um, mega planet in our system of um, sequencing is the TCGA or the cancer genomics data, which is about uh, two and a half uh, petabytes currently. And then there's some other big data sources like the thousand genomes and um, ENCODE and so forth that you've probably all heard about. Uh, what I think is kind of interesting, in addition to the amount of the data and it being in these sources, is how the sequencing data is becoming so big, it's kind of diffusing through um, different fields. So there's, of course, canonical human genome sequencing. We all know about that. But what's also interesting is the amount of sequenced, um, the amount of species being sequenced is rapidly, rapidly going up. So there's this tremendous diversity of sequencing as well as just more and more human genomes. And what I think is also kind of cool is sequencing, because it's becoming so easy and so powerful, is kind of um, diffusing from this core discipline of genomics and genetics outwards. And so you can see that in a kind of neat way in this graph. This graph shows the cumulative number of bases associated with publications in different journals. So uh, Nature has traditionally been one of the major journals of genomics, and you can see it's always leading in terms of cumulative number of bases deposited. And then second is Science and Cell, which you can see here. And these are big general interest journals and what you kind of expect to see large amounts of data associated with them. And then there's some journals down here like Genome Biology, I don't know if we have, you know, Nature Biotech that you kind of expect to be associated with sequencing. They also have a lot of um, bases associated with them. But what's very neat is if you look at this bottom part of this graph here, suddenly right here, there starts to be a lot of bases associated with publications in these journals. And what are these journals? Nature Chemical Biology, um, also the, the International Journal of, sort of Systems and Molecular Ecology, and there's, uh, and there's also Molecular Ecology. And so these are journals that are, are fields that traditionally uh, weren't associated with very large-scale sequencing, and now you can see uh, the sequencing technology uh, spreading out into these uh, fields as well. So let's think a little bit more about this um, sort of scaling um, type of thing. So when we were at the kind of beginning of the curve I showed you around 2000 when the genome was sequenced, when you looked at the uh, what went into a sequencing experiment, most of the money that went into a sequencing experiment went into sequencing, as you might expect, because that was the, um, the you know, main thing that you were doing. But what's happening now more and more is when we come to sequencing a new human genome or we come to sequencing something else, very little money is actually going into sequencing. It's the cost of sequencing is actually dropping down to almost zero per base, right? And instead, the costs are taken up by um, other things, in particular, the procuring of the sample 
is becoming a, a bigger and bigger cost. So now we're not sequencing a generic human genome. We're sequencing individuals that have very specific diseases or very hard to get at samples. And the other thing that's, of course, taking up more and more of the pie is analysis. Um, and that's, of course, what you're going to hear about a little today. And I should point out that this is a little bit analogous, I think, to the situation in photography or imaging. So when people first started creating um, photographs, of course, the big thing was making the image. You know, the, you know, Daguerre or something in the, you know, 19th century. And it was, everything was making just an image of anything. And of course, you know, um, nowadays, imaging is free. You know, you, you can essentially, the average person can essentially take an infinite number of pictures with their phone, and the actual imaging itself is free. But of course, now what the big thing is how, what you do with the images, how you collect them, and also downstream things that you would do with the images. And I think sequencing will kind of, kind of, uh, occupy a similar niche in the future. So let's look in detail at some of these things. So if you look at the actual sequencing pie where we are now, you know, you can kind of see, you know, this is sort of how it breaks down um, from equipment and labor and so forth. But what I think is actually particularly interesting is if you look at the, if you break the processing of the sequencing down into two parts. One is kind of the data reduction and data management part, which is kind of this gray bit, and then there's the downstream analysis. What's interesting is concomitant with the um, increase in sequencing uh, capacity, we also have this Moore's Law in computing. And so actually, it probably doesn't take that much more kind of computer dollars to process a data set, at least do the simple processing of a data set in um, 2016 as it maybe did in 2000. And also, a lot of the technology that we're using for the basic operations, like the mapping to the genome, and the um, sort of variant calling have been getting faster and faster. And so this kind of shows that picture here for a lot of the programs we use. You can see how they're exponentially, um, they're running exponentially faster. So you maybe, some of the older people here maybe remember the program BLAST, which was used originally for sequence comparison, and then they maybe remember moving to BLAT and then to things like STAR and BWA. These programs are using different technologies. They're transitioning from using things like dynamic programming to using indexing to using these very sophisticated things like the Burroughs Rural Transform, and they're going faster and faster. And this just shows that picture now in, with, on a smaller genome. Um, the other thing that you can see is the downstream analysis is taking a bigger and bigger portion of the pie. And what is that really? Well, downstream analysis is people, actually, people thinking you can't automate this yet, <laughs> uh, though we're trying. Um, and of course, because we need more and more people to do this type of analysis, I think we really see a common increase in the number of roles for people doing uh, bioinformatics and computational biology uh, full time. So this just shows um, uh, some, uh, a graph from someone's website where they kind of diagram the number of uh, faculty positions in bioinformatics and computational biology over the years. Okay, so that was an introduction where I talked to you a little about the scaling, and then I'm going to talk to you how we can do one way of thinking about how we can deal with this large amount of data uh, in terms of prioritizing variants, in terms of uh, looking at a few variants. And then I'm going to talk about some ways that we have of finding features to prioritize variants. Um, such as intersecting with, with annotation, looking at network connectivity, looking at allele, allelic activity, and then kind of combining a lot of these things together in workflows to do um, large-scale burdening um, and to sort of find uh, cancer drivers. And at the end, I want to have a little postscript where I kind of uh, sort of talk a little bit about science of science as we were kind of at the beginning of how the, um, this whole, in, you, can, you can study this whole in, endeavor. Um, Okay, so let's go through um, each of the things, now focusing on the landscape of uh, variants. So let's now uh, drill into the situation of um, a person getting their genome sequenced. And so I think that, um, you know, it, it's interesting. In the past, I think people came to genomics as a subcorollary of genetics, and genetics was a subcorollary of biology, and so they came to the idea of genomics very late in the discussion. But I actually think in the future it's going to be completely inverted. People will come to genomics before they come to biology. And why do I, what do I mean there? It's because what's going to happen in the future is everyone's going to have their sequence done, particularly if they're sick. And if you're sick, imagine, it's scary to say, you have cancer or something, you're going to have your genome done. And you're going to immediately confront all the variants that you have, particularly the variants that are associated with your disease. 
After you confront the variants that are associated with your disease, you're going to ask the question of what do these mean? What does it mean that I have this alteration, this variant? And that's going to naturally lead you into a discussion of biology. What's going on? Is this a tr you know, transcription factor binding? Site is altered? Is the gene being altered? And so forth. And so I think our fundamental relationship in educational terms between genomics and biology is going to get inverted. And so how, how are we going to tell people about how to interpret their genomes in the future? Well, there's sort of two ways of doing it. One way, of course, is in terms of very basic mechanistic biology, but another way is through the database, and that is by taking one person's genome, one person's set of variants, and putting it in the context of the population of all of us here. You know, do you have a variant that is shared with many people? Do you have something rare? What has this been associated with? And of course, genetics has a lot to say about how to think about that uh, process. And let me tell you, just give you a few basic um, things that people would, would say. And this is, this is information that's mostly from, that I've gotten from the Thousand Genomes Consortium, which really just published um, a while ago, just a big catalog of variants. So let's just talk about the average person. So the average person, that means everyone in this room basically, has, you know, about 4 million um, variants relative to the reference genome in terms of SNPs, and they have maybe 500 to 600,000 indels, and then they have about maybe two to 3,000 uh, larger deletions. And one thing that's important to realize is even though that last number is much smaller than the number of SNPs, the, those big variants occupy a very big chunk of genomic uh, real estate. And that's the kind of overall picture. But what's interesting is when you look into your genome, what you'll see is of those 4 million or so variants, maybe one, say maybe 2 percent of them are fairly rare. That means that you tend to have them and other people don't, and most of them are kind of common variants, okay? And that's very important in terms of thinking about which ones are going to have the bigger impact and which ones might be associated with your disease. Now, when you come to studying a group of people, it's very important to realize that things change very much. Because when you start to look at, say, 1,000 genes, which has 2,500 people, the number of variants that you're looking at obviously goes up, but you tend to restudy the common variants over and over again. So most of the variants you're actually looking at are rare variants. So when we move, when we move out to population scale sequencing, what we're really looking at all the time is tons and tons of rare variants, because that's what you see when you sequence thousands of people. Now, when we look at a cancer genome, let me just give you a little bit of the numerics of that process. Um, first of all, I just want to point out that in the normal germline, most of those variants that you're seeing, of course, are in the non-coding regions of the genome. People realize that only about a percent or so of our genome is coding, and that, that bit of the genome is under actually stronger selection. So only about 20,000 of the variants are actually in genes. Most of them are non-coding. And that pattern is echoed in an even stronger way in a cancer genome. So the average cancer genome, and this is average, you know, very variable in cancer genome, average number about 5,000 variants in a cancer genome. Many have more, many have less. And of those 5,000, we only expect maybe 50 to occur within um, genes. And so as you can see, the numbers start to drop really quickly as people kind of home in on what they think is the um, kind of key events. And so one of the, um, the ways that people have of dealing with this uh, tremendous um, number of variants is really to kind of break it into these categories and to really think about them in different ways. I mean, when you deal with kind of common uh, variants that are commonly associated with people, people usually think that they have a fairly weak um, effect, uh, but you can test for that effect over a large number of people because they're um, shared. Rare variants, people have this idea that they usually have a much stronger effect, much greater functional impact, um, but you can't test for them in the same way. And uh, when you think, I, I think one thing that's quite useful to think about is to think of cancer genomes, which are somatic uh, variants, as a kind of extreme of rare variants, right? So these are now uh, variants that are localized not even to an individual, but just to a cell in an individual or something like that. Um, and people often really want to think about which, which of those really have the strong um, impact. And often you can't see them reoccurring in the same region, so you have to kind of think of them as kind of uh, burdening a particular annotation. And in the cancer field, people tend to um, have this idea that the cancer is driven by a very small number of mutations, the driver mutations, that occur in uh, key regions of the genome. And I kind of schematized a little bit of this in this uh, picture here, where 
you can imagine looking at a bunch of um, individuals uh, here, and here are your um, some representation of all the pooled variants from those people. And so you can see in any one person, there's much more uh, common variants than rare. But when you look at the pool, of course, there's more rare than common. And you can also see that if you look at a common variant, you can probably test for differences between the diseased individuals and the healthy ones. But you can't do that realistically that easily for rare ones. But if you kind of aggregate them together, you can uh, kind of do that. OK, so that sort of brings me to the point of this talk, you know, how do we um, prioritize variants? How do, and how do we think about these uh, rare variants? How do we prioritize them uh, when it's not as easy to kind of uh, see their effects in the framework of traditional association studies? So first of all, I'm going to talk to you about various features, uh, particularly non-coding features, because that's where most of these variants lie, that really highlight some as um, being very, having a very strong impact. And within the uh, non-coding annotation world, there's sort of two basic uh, things that people do. Um, one thing they do is they look for conserved regions of the genome. Okay, and that can be a region conserved within the human population, between human and mouse, or even just blocks repeated in the genome. And they, that, that conserved thing is a type of annotation. And then, of course, there's also the functional genomics. Um, way of thinking about what's going on in the genome. And here, you imagine someone does a noisy experiment over the whole genome that says what the genome is doing. Is it being transcribed? Is it being bound to? What, what's happening? And then the bioinformaticians, we take that noisy signal, as I'll show you, and we process it into little blocks of annotation that sort of talk about this is maybe a binding site, this is maybe a, a transcribed region, and so forth. And so let me sort of take you through a little bit of what that looks like. Here is actually what it the data looks like, for instance, for, say, chip seat peak calling, where you have the noisy signal, and people have some concept of threshold in the signal. Of course, when you look into it in detail, it's a little more complicated than that. There's also statistical issues when they threshold the signal to get these targets. And one of the important things that people have come up with in this process is really thinking about a kind of control experiment, which is, in a sense, obvious, but was a big innovation, where they score against what's called an input control to get enriched targets. And we did this a number of years ago in this framework of this program we developed called PeakSeq, which is very similar to a number of the other uh, very common callers, such as MAX or SBP. And I'm just going to quickly show you one of the innovations that we've done recently is really to develop an idea of calling on many scales. So when you, if you look at a signal like this, you know, one of the challenges is really to say, well, is this little thing a peak or is this whole region a peak and so forth? And, you know, and the, the literature on signal processing, often from things like electrical engineering, have a lot to say about this. And so there's, a, there's actually a very systematic way that you could smooth this signal and call peaks at many different uh, scales. And we've done that in the framework of this uh, program we call music. And actually, it's quite nice to see. So here's the music multi-scale decomposition. Here's the actual signal here. Here's the different scales we're looking at. And you can see that as we go along the different scales, we'll call you know, a feature, but maybe if one feature will merge into another feature. Some features don't exist as you get to bigger and bigger scales. And so I think the scale of the feature is quite a useful thing uh, to think about. So that's kind of how we annotate the genome a little bit. And then the, one of the big questions is how do we interrelate that annotation with conservation? Um, now, one of the um, original criticisms, I think you probably heard of ENCODE and a lot of the functional genomics efforts, was that uh, they didn't really interrelate the annotations too much with conservation. So people were a little surprised by the fact that very little fraction of these annotations were actually conserved. And the, the real hardcore biologists or hardcore evolutionists said, well, geez, you know, if something is not really conserved or if selection is not really working on it, I don't believe it's very important because the mindset is that conservation and um, selection are very central to why something is um, preserved. And so this actually shows that result. Here's a, a metric of uh, selection. This is actually a somewhat technical metric. This is from looking at the population. This is the fraction of rare SNPs within an annotation or the depletion of common variants. Uh, within an annotation. Here's the metric for coding. You see it, it's very high. Here's the genomic average. And here's things like transcription factor binding sites, uh, non-coding RNAs from ENCODES. And you can see that in aggregate they're under some selection, but it's very, very weak. Okay? And one of the things that we did is this was kind of the original criticism of ENCODE in, say, 
2012 and so forth. And one of the things that we were able to do is using the vast amount of data produced from 1,000 genomes, we were able to say, okay, 1,000 genomes gives us much better statistics now on um, w where things are, are conserved. So as opposed to looking at all transcription factor bonding sites, we can split them up. And so let's, for instance, split them up into the transcription factor bonding sites associated with different factors, such as HMG, 4CAD, BZIP, and so forth. And you can see that these groups have very different selection properties on them, right? And so what we were able to do overall is we were able to identify about 700 different categories of annotation and find that many of these categories of annotation had very different selection properties on them. And in fact, we were able to identify a group of annotations that in total comprise about the size of the exome that had a very strong amount of selection on them, very similar to what coding has on them. So th this is a, a part of the non-coding genome that uh, is functional from the perspective of um, the ENCODE thing, but also has an appreciable amount of selection on it uh, as the coding regions do. And we, we call these sensitive and ultra-sensitive sites. And then just as with coding genes, how we can separate uh, in a lot of these sites the more deleterious mutation from the other. Remember, in coding, we often have this concept of, say, a non-synonymous change versus synonymous change or loss of function change. We can do the same thing in, re in these uh, sensitive regulatory regions. We can actually see if the SNP breaks the transcription factor binding site mo motif and we can see the selection on it or it actually uh, enhances that uh, motif. And so we, we can kind of, um, in this more restricted set of annotations, uh, look at their impact in uh, a somewhat more traditional way. And so the idea here was introducing this notion of annotation and then this notion of sensitive sites. So another type of things we can, another type of thing we can do to um, provide annotation on the, on the genome is we can link things up. And so, for instance, we can link um, uh, regulatory regions that are right upstream of a gene with, of course, the gene, and actually through some somewhat more complicated maneuvering, uh, we can even link uh, fairly distal sites up to genes, that those distal sites being enhancers and so forth. And then if we think of the transcription factor as operating on the site and the site to be linked to the gene and so forth, we can construct uh, networks. And so this is a picture, for instance, of the, the 2012 ENCODE regulatory network which comprised about a half a million edges where an edge represented a transcription factor regulating a gene through a site. And then we can, of course, filter this to maybe get the strongest of uh, edges in the hairball. So we can do a little haircut to get the best um, edges. And there we get about 25,000 edges in the regulatory network. Still a large number, but a more easily dealable number. And then one of the things that uh, people have found uh, historically from the analysis of networks, one of the, the laws of network science, per se, that's emerged is that um, everything is an equal in the network framework and that almost invariably whenever you look at a biological network or um, something, a, a natural network, you tend to have the emergence of hubs, things that have high connectivity and those being separated from things that have low connectivity. And they, the usual uh, thing people have observed is the occurrence of a power law distribution, a kind of uh, heavy tail distribution. Uh, where you have these hubs. And then uh, what people have also observed in many different contexts in biology, looking at model organisms, looking at humans, looking at protein interaction networks, looking at regulatory networks, they've observed that the hubs or the things that have higher connectivity also have higher constraint. That means they're more conserved. And that sort of makes intuitive sense, uh, but it's nice to see. Here's a picture, for instance, that shows the human protein protein interaction network and the more quickly evolving, the particularly quickly evolving is kind of kind of on the outside of that network. Of course, this is backed up by a lot more statistics. This just gives you a little picture of it. Now, when we look at the uh, regulatory network, um, we actually observe the same type of pattern. And this is a, now the regulatory network I showed you with 25,000 things is kind of hard to visualize. But if I take the, tw the 25,000 genes, I'm sorry, the 25,000 edges and I associate them with genes, and then I associate the genes, and I make two categories of genes. I make genes that are tolerant of loss of function mutations, which means you can knock them out very easily, and genes which are known to be very essential. You can see, even by eye, that the genes that are kind of more in the center of the network, 
they tend to be um, more essential. And you can, of course, see this in various statistics that you can do. And so the basic idea is that the hubs in the network are a little bit more essential. Another type of annotation. So then let me talk to you about a third type of feature that we can look at, and that's allele-specific binding and expression. So this is a very direct readout of the effect, in a sense, of the variant. And let me explain what I mean here. So, let, so as you all know, uh, you actually have two copies of a genome within you. You have your mother's genome, or half of your mother's genome and half of your father's genome. Okay, And those uh, two genomes actually can have slightly different um, variants on them. So for instance, I, it might be that in a particular uh, transcription factor binding site in your genome, your uh, father's genome might have a T and your mother's genome, for instance, might have a C. And you can imagine that in certain cases, when it comes to a transcription factor binding there, uh, the transcription factor will bind more easily to, the, to the, your, uh, the, the place in your father's genome because it binds more easily with this a T. And this could also happen in relation to uh, gene expression. And so people look at these differences called allelic effects, where they'll see the difference between two alleles. And to some degree, and not all the time, but to some degree, you can think of even in a causal sense this binding being better here because it mechanistically works. Now it doesn't, the more, things are a little more complicated than what I said because the binding at a particular spot can be associated with lots of things happening upstream and the chromatin and so on and so forth. But on a simple-minded picture, I think it's, it's reasonable to, to think of what I just said. So you, now one of the really nice things about next-gen sequencing is you actually get, when you do an RNA-seq or chip-seq experiment, you get a perfect allele experiment just right there. And that's because each of the reads that you uh, sequence actually has the sequence of the underlying uh, thing that's being bound to or being, uh, being transcribed. It's a tag for it. So if there's a heterozygous SNP at a particular position, you'll be able to see, for instance here, that there's more reads associated with the T allele than the C allele, okay? And then you can actually read that out. Now then, of course, you come to actually doing, there's a lot of statistics behind this that I'm not getting into. You actually have to compare this to kind of what you expect, and then there's all these weird confounding effects such as uh, reference bias and so forth. But the bottom line is you can make these calls for what's called allele-specific uh, heterozygous SNPs. And these are SNPs that, to a first approximation, you can think of as when there's a SNP there, it actually affects some um, activity. And so we've done this in detail, in particular in the framework of 1,000 genomes, building many personal genomes, uh, you know, uh, aligning the RNA-seq and chip-seq reads to uh, hundreds of them, and then making a little bit of a database of the, um, all the variants. And let me show you what you get when you get this, make this little database. Um, so you can kind of imagine looking through uh, the genome, and here's, here's places in the genome, different annotations and so forth. And then you can think of these being different individuals. And in some individuals, you might have an allelic SNP, and other individuals there might not be. Or maybe then sometimes there's a SNP uh, in many individuals that's always uh, allelic. And let me just uh, zoom in on these uh, regions here. So for instance, in this region here, you have a lot of allelic SNPs. Many of them are at the same uh, position, okay? And in here, this is more of an instance where you have rare variants. Most of these people don't have the variants, but the few variants are allelic. And so you can use these patterning of allelic SNPs to provide some sort of annotation for that region being very associated with allelic activity, or you can provide, it provides some annotation uh, for rare variants having some um, effect. And remember also the rare variants are not able to be uh, studied through the traditional uh, EQTL or association type of approaches. And so we've done this. We've um, collected all these ASC and ASB variants into little regions, and we've made kind of highly allelic regions and highly non-allelic regions. You know, and this is another type of annotation. And when we look at these annotations, we find, you know, some interesting things on a high level. We find that, in general, enhancers, for some reason, seem to be depleted in allelic activity. Um, but there are certain transcription factors, which I think are, we, oh, you can see their names here, which tend to be a little bit uh, enhanced in it and so forth. Uh, and in general, a little bit less activity uh, at UTRs in terms of um, ASC. But these are very high level, and I think it's more useful to think about a specific um, uh, annotation block. Okay, so those are different, um, different ways we have of annotating the genome in related to conservation. Um, finding other features like allelicity or uh, hubbiness that 
also can prioritize variants. So, so now what I'm going to talk about is how we put these things together, how we take the annotations, a lot of the data together, and in two ways kind of put it together to test for if particular groups of variants represent um, are a high imp are very impactful. Okay? And I'm going to center this a little bit more on the cancer context. Um, but the, the analysis is pretty much uh, applicable to rare germline uh, SNPs as well, and I'll talk about them a little bit interchangeably. So first I'm going to talk about um, this uh, framework we've developed called LARVA to do burden testing on um, annotations. And so how does LARVA work? Um, well, let me show you the picture here. And again, this is sort of the picture we had looked at earlier where you have people, different types. And now, now to make it a little bit more complicated, these people have different, there's different groups of people that have different types of cancer. So for instance, this, this group might have lung cancer, this group might have colon cancer, and so forth. And then you have essentially random scatter shots through the genome, right, of these somatic mutations. And the game in um, the um, somatic analysis, the driver analysis, is to say, I mean, is there, a, for instance, a, a spot that's always mutated in this cancer or always mutated through these cancers? Probably not. But maybe there's a region of the genome, like this region, that's more mutated, right? But now, one complication that, of course, when you drill into it, it gets more complicated. One complication is that um, different regions of the genome have different intrinsic mutation rates because some regions of the genome are replicated early, some are replicated late, some have different GC content, some are an open chromatin, and you have to subtract these co-founders from the picture. And so the idea is usually that people believe that late replicating regions tend to have higher mutation rates than early replicating regions. So you kind of have to statistically remove these covariates. And so I'm going to go a little into how we do that. And after you've kind of dealt with that, then you have these annotations in the genome. And you can ask, are these annotations, which say represent genes or transcription factor binding sites, non-cutting arrays, are they more burdened than you might expect given the um, particular values of these covariates? And so, for instance, here would be a very burdened region versus this one. Okay, so now that was abstract, high level. Uh, let me, I'm going to do a little bit of a dive now. So this is a good chance to fall asleep if you want to. Just wake up later. Uh, so we're going to go a little bit into the details of this. So here's actually what it looks like if you were looking at um, cancer genomes. So you can see the tremendous mutational heterogeneity in cancer genomes. And so, for instance, this is a log scale. Here's many different um, types of cancer you see which change very much in mutation. And then within the cancer, each dot represents different people. So you can see that if you're, say, looking at breast cancer, you're looking over four logs of variance in, you know, mutation rates. So there's tremendous heterogeneity there. And then if you look across the genome, just in general, you'll see a, a tremendous heterogeneity in the amount of mutation. So we have to deal with this heterogeneity. And so the little tiny bit of math here, so what we did to do this is the, the naive way to do this is to sort of build a binomial model. Then, and the na naive way is what you do is you sort of assume that each mutation is like a random dart being thrown at the genome, right? And there's a sort of binomial process that has a rate of throwing random darts. And, you know, a given cancer or a given mutational process gives a certain number, uh, a rate of random dart throwing. And then you want to see in a given region if you have more random darts than you might expect given this binomial process. And that's the kind of simplest approach is sort of a global model. But now we can make it a little bit more complicated. So the, the simplest thing that you might do is we might say, oh, this mutation rate that we are observing, P, this mutation rate actually varies. It's not P, it's PI. It varies across the genome, okay? And now we can make that uh, mutation rate uh, vary according to a particular probability distribution and for convenience, one distribution to use, and it's nice to use is the beta distribution. And the reason that it's very nice to do that is that you'll end up with this kind of beta binomial uh, model when you're finished. And in particular, a third thing you can do is you can actually make the mutational rate in this beta distribution, or the parameter, the hyperparameters in the beta distribution, um, depend on known covariance, such as the replication timing, the GC content, and so forth. And so we can make a kind of, these are different levels of model. You know, this is, the, like I said, some people are sleeping, some are wide awake, staring at the screen. You never know. Some people might be closet math fiends. You never know. Um, but in any case, that, that's, that's what our, we have these different models. 
And you know, you might say to yourself, well, I don't care, um, but they make a very big difference. They make a gargantuan difference. And this picture just kind of shows the difference. The black line is the empirical distribution of mutation counts in different bins. You know, some bins have, have a, sort of about 20, and then some are highly burdened. And if you make a um, beta binomial model, I'm sorry, if you make a binomial model, you'll get this red line, and you'll see you'll call a gargantuan fraction of the genome uh, as being highly mutated. But that's just wrong, because the, the mutation counts are highly overdispersed. And so if you make the little beta binomial model that we described, you'll get a much better fit, particularly at this tail, which is the tail, of course, is you're trying to see something that's mutated more than you would expect based on a normal uh, random mutational processes. And uh, this is a picture. Now, this is a little uh, technical. This just shows that um, if you split your um, bins that you're looking at into early replication timing, late replication timing bins, you'll actually, um, you'll, the correction makes a tremendous difference in the bottom 10 percent of the uh, replication timing bins versus the uh, top 10 percent. So that's really where it makes a big difference. And we, of course, have a, a software that does this. Our software is called Larva. You can download it in what's called a Docker image and so forth, and, you know, you can do all sorts of things with it. Uh, now, one of the things, what, what does larva do? Well, larva goes to the genome and scores the regions as being significantly mutated relative to this somewhat more sophisticated background model. And so what it does is it prevents uh, what's called p-value inflation. And so here's a picture of the p-values from um, uh, larva, and here's the p-values that you get from the binomial. You can see the big inflation here, and the larva ones are much closer to the line. And here's a picture of almost like a Manhattan plot showing the, uh, the p-values and the big inflation for the binomial. And then here's the type of regions that are pulled out. You, maybe you recognize some of the well-known ones, like the TERT uh, promoter, the TP53 promoter. These are very well-known uh, cancer regions. But there's some, a few other things pulled out uh, by this program as well. Okay, so that's this uh, burden testing, taking into account the um, genomic features and um, the annotation. And now a little bit on evidence integration. So we focused um, mostly up to now on one, only a few types of um, evidence, but we've talked about many things. You know, we've talked about helicity, hubbiness, annotations, um, breaking sites, and so forth. And so you can kind of imagine maybe there's some way of putting all of those things together into an overall functional impact score. And so a number of years ago, we developed a conceptual framework for building this uh, score, it's a very simple idea. The idea basically is if you start off with a bunch of, let's start off with somatic mutations. You could also imagine these as rare germline mutations, same thing. And you wanted to see how impactful they were and you wanted to prioritize them. Well, what would you do? You would first see, you would first say give a point to those things that lie in annotation, okay? And then you maybe would give another point to them if they lie in annotation, and that annotation is in that little group of annotations that I talked about earlier that's sensitive or ultra-sensitive and particularly conserved in terms of normal variation. And then you'd maybe give another point if you could see that the mutation has an obvious functional impact, say breaking a motif or changing a transcription factor binding site. And then you'd maybe give another point if you know that that um, transcription factor binding site was actually a promoter that sits in the center of a regulatory network hub, right? You see, it's somehow more important. And then, then you could go on and pass it into the um, recurrence analysis, say, from the um, larva. So that's the conceptual scheme, okay? And uh, a number of years ago, we uh, figured out how to make, do this conceptual scheme in practice on a cancer genome. And so, for instance, this is from one of the original prostate cancer genome sequenced by Berger et al. in 2011. The, this particular genome I'm looking at here had about 2,000 SNVs. And, you know, you can kind of walk, you know, just for simplicity, you can do what I just did but walk through a flow chart. Is it an ultra-sensitive region? Is it in the hub? And so forth. And the neat thing here is when you walk through this process, at the end, you get like one mutation. And the nice thing about that is if you get one mutation, you go from the world of big data to the world of kind of traditional laboratory testing, and someone can actually figure out if that, real, if that is doing anything or not. And you can't do that for 10,000 mutations and so forth. And so, someone, so you can actually do 
uh, some validations on this, and we did, um, we're not, we were in collaboration with others, we did validations on this, and they, these mutations were more impactful. So uh, uh, after coming up with this conceptual scheme, which we call FunSeq, um, we uh, tried to develop this into a little bit more of an um, um, automated tool, and I won't go into the details of the tool, I'll just tell you two things about it. One is there's this con the concept in the tool of the data context. There's a very large context of all the annotations, the allelic sites, the network hubs, and so forth. There's this concept of you uploading your variants to the thing, and then somehow um, prioritizing or weighting the variants and getting some report. That's the high level of what this tool does. And one of the key things that the tool does is it has a, a notion of how it weights all the different genomic features relative to each other. And I won't go into a lot of detail on how it um, does the weighting, but it has this entropy-based weighting scheme where basically it weights an annotation or a feature in accord to how many natural, natural polymorphisms, not um, somatic polymorphisms or rare mutations that you get in that, or say natural common polymorphisms you get in that uh, feature. And so, for instance, a feature that, um, for instance, these uh, dark features here, they get few uh, polymorphisms relative to the side, they get very highly weighted and so forth. And this is the, so it's a sort of entropy based, um, you, people probably recognize the P log P type of formula as being associated with um, a sort of information theoretic entropy. So we essentially weight everything in relation to this. Uh, information theoretic entropy, and we think we get an, a fair weighting of all the different features. And then, of course, we can um, do different um, uh, types of validation uh, for this uh, type of thing. Here we show a validation based on um, uh, germline, um, uh, rare germline SNPs, where there's databases such as HGMD and ClinVar that tabulate um, known disease-causing mutations, and we can see that these things get higher, more impactful scores on average than, say, um, random mutations. And of course, how you select those random mutations is actually a uh, somewhat complicated issue, so there's different ways of matching it. And you can see this in terms of one of these violin plots, or you can see it in terms of more of a predictive type of context with rock plots. Okay, so now I think I'd like to summarize. So we've talked, uh, so hopefully a, a lot of the room remains awake. Um, so uh, we've, let me summarize what I've kind of talked to you about, and then I'm going to have this little bit of postscript at the end. Um, so what I've uh, told you about today is I started off by telling you about the notion of more and more data, you know, big data, um, you know, and how the big data we have, how it, we can think about it in terms of scaling. The scaling is very important when you think of the production of data, when you think of the analysis data, and you think about this exponential scaling. And then I talked a little bit about one of the key ways we have of grappling with this uh, a large amount of data is through prioritization and selecting from millions and literally billions of variants a few variants that we think of as highly impactful. And I talked about how do we go of finding these variants that are highly impactful, different ideas. And, you know, one of the ideas is to focus on these rarer variants as opposed to the more uh, common ones. And I talked about ways we can um, annotate this as being impactful, obviously, how they relate to non-coding annotation, how they relate to, to annotation that's in conserved areas of the genome, how they relate to network hubs, and then how they relate to elements that we know are allelic. That means that we know have differential activity um, between uh, when there's a variant between the maternal and paternal genomes. And then I talked a little bit about how we can put all of these features and how these things, how we can put them together. And, and we sort of talked about two ways. One um, way is this kind of burden test idea, where we have this larva idea where we basically see in a genomic region, do we have more variants than we'd expect relative to some model? And I tried to explain that the model can't be a really simplistic model like a binomial model. We really have to incorporate the idea of many different genomic covariates that take into account many different underlying random genomic processes, uh, such as uh, the replication timing. And then I talked about a second tool, and this is this FunSeq tool, which really uh, is about how we, in a principal way, integrate many of these different evidence sources, and we have this kind of entropy-based uh, weighting scheme, and the entropy-based weighting scheme allows us to kind of score 
uh, the variance in a principal way, and we can, fi we can find that known disease-causing variants uh, do get higher scores. And so that's the overall picture we have of, you know, how we can go from a large amount of data to kind of prioritize things to get at these um, more impactful mutations, which hopefully can be tested and which are useful for a more medical context. And now I want to kind of grow out. I started out with this kind of very big picture of data and the world of sequencing. And I want to talk a little bit about just a tiny kind of postscript of we can also study how we do science and stuff, right? And so a lot of this science actually doesn't take place um, uh, in individual laboratories. It, take pl it takes place in the framework of large groups and large consortia. And you can actually study these entities themselves as objects, and, um, which I find kind of interesting. Um, and so, for instance, a lot of the work I described today took place in the framework of these uh, consortia, such as the ENCODE project, which had a pilot phase, a production phase, a model organism pilot, and then a final phase where there was a kind of comparative phase, or the Thousand Genomes project, which had different phases, and now there's some follow-ons, uh, such as the GTEx project and so forth. And so we can kind of think about how, how do these um, organizations work. And I just wanted to point out that more and more we see a kind of increase in the amount of the fraction of our um, scientific effort uh, associated with these, um, with consortium science. And so one thing uh, we were able to do by taking a look at the ENCO consortium and through the help of NHGRI, we were able to identify uh, the many members of this consortium and many um, people who are outside the consortium that were using uh, the information from the consortium. And we were able to look at their uh, interrelationships and their publication patterns. And so overall, uh, we looked at about 1,200 uh, different papers that were published uh, with about um, 10,000 different um, individuals, some of them within ENCODE and some without. And we tried to ask, how were these um, people and the papers that they produced uh, working together? And so one of the things that you can see is you can see that the uh, people within the consortium uh, were obviously producing uh, a lot of uh, papers fairly early on. And obviously, in the later phases, you start to see uh, more people from outside using the uh, data from the consortium, as probably makes sense. What's not as intuitive is if you kind of graph the histogram of the size of these papers, it's at, you might think, oh, the people in the consortium publishing very big, big papers, the people outside not. Very little differences in the size of the paper. So a lot of the interaction of these people outside with the people inside represent different big groups of people kind of interacting with each other. And then you can do a kind of um, network group, uh, view of this uh, type of data where you can uh, plot for each year uh, from the inception of the consortium all the way until uh, the um, current time. Uh, the, the, all the papers published in each paper represent it, that's published represents uh, authors working together where the linkage is the here each node represents a person they're linked together if they co-publish and you can see in the way this graph is sort of set out it kind of creates these kind of concentric ring structures where you have um, this group of members that closely publish together you have the group of people colored in red that are non-members and then you have this group that I'm going to talk about in a second that I call um, brokers that sit in the middle of these two, uh, two groups. And so you can see this nice increase, and you can see the formation of these uh, ring-like structures. Now, the way you get to that intuitive picture is through analyzing a little bit of the statistics of these graphs that you're looking at. And there's some important statistics that you can look at. You can look at the, just the number of clusters in each of those graphs, the number of kind of disjoint clusters. And as you might imagine, the number of clusters in the ENCODE group is fairly, is fairly consistent because they're all the people are kind of together. They're always publishing together in this group, and it's fairly uniform over a number of years. Whereas the number of clusters of the non-members goes up fairly dramatically. So many disparate, different groups of people using the thing. And if, there's some notion of it comparing this to some random expectation. But then what you can also do is you can compute a number called the modularity. And the modularity describes how um, how truly um, disjoint your clusters are. So if you have a very modular graph, it really does break into disjoint clusters, whereas one that's not doesn't. And one of the things that you can see 
is that the ENCODE group, really, it, go, it tends to go up and down a little bit more dramatically, and then up and down is reflective of its big publication cycles, such as the uh, rollouts of those big papers in 2007 and 2012, whereas you don't see the same patterning at all to the um, non-member group. And then uh, another thing you can do is you can plot for each of these different uh, groups, you can plot the number, for each person, you can plot the number of connections they have within the group, the ENCODE group, versus the number of connections they have to people outside of the group, and likewise to the people outside. And what you see is you see there's some people that have a lot of connectivity uh, within the group, um, I'd say, but not very much to the outside. And then there's some people that are mostly connected outside. But there's a few people, and these are these uh, green people here, uh, which have a tremendous amount of connectivity to both groups. And so we're arguing that one of the um, key points here is that this group of green people, <laughs> which we call brokers, these are the groups that really connect the, um, the two um, groups together, and these people are very important in terms of um, really diffusing the information um, on the genome annotation outwards. And, oops. There we go. Oops, no. Uh, and then I'll just say we've repeated this analysis on an, a related consortium that is somewhat independent called the Mod Encode Consortium, and you get a very similar uh, picture. And I just uh, finished the postscript here. Really, the point was that in addition to having this kind of data scaling in larger and larger data, we're also really having science done in larger and larger uh, groups. And I think it's important to think about these. Uh, the structure of these groups, and one of the things that we uh, call out here is this role for these uh, broker individuals in these uh, groups. Okay, so now I'll um, uh, sort of acknowledge all the people that have uh, done this type of stuff. So let me um, start by uh, telling you about the, uh, a lot of the, the, the cost of sequencing and the scaling thing. That's really led by Paul Muir, who's a graduate student uh, with me. Uh, a lot of the um, genome annotation was led by Riff Harmanchi, who's an associate research scientist with me, and Joe Rosofsky. Uh, Jeming Chen, who is a graduate student, led the allele uh, analysis work. Um, now, and Ekta Karana and Yao Fu, uh, who both have left the lab, Ekta is now in a faculty position in New York City here in Cornell, and Yao works at a, a biotech uh, company in California. They uh, developed the um, network connectivity analysis, and they also developed the FunSeq system for weighting the different uh, things together. And that, this, the FunSeq was really done in, in as part of Thousand uh, Genomes, the Thousand Genomes Project. And then Lucas Lachowski, a uh, graduate student in Jingzhang, a postdoc, really developed the larva uh, a burden testing thing. And Dai Feng Wang, a uh, research scientist, developed the uh, author's analysis. And with that, I'll thank you very much for your attention and hope you haven't fallen asleep. Thank you. Thank you. That was fabulous. So let's let's take some questions and please um, use the microphones. And maybe we'll wait a minute until the, those who can bear to tear themselves away from the question period leave the room. So. Most of the people getting up are going yeah. out. They're That's not okay. No, no, look, there are lots of people. Um, and, um, and, I, and I suppose I'll, I'll do the usual, take, take the prior, my prerogative and ask the first question. And so um, uh, to a more naive person like myself, there are many ways that you can think about annotating the genome and deciding what variants are important. And it's really critical for all sort of all kinds of work. Um, I'm not going to ask you why your program or your approach is better or worse, because that would be impolitic. However, if I, if I ask it in a different way, what are the biggest challenges that you haven't addressed or that you think need to be addressed? Um, and, and if you are thinking about also applying it to, say, common variation, um, where it seems to me we also have the same issues and the same desires, how would you, how would you do that or, how, you know, um, because not all, not all, rare, while some rare variants are wonderful, you know, there are lots of, there are PCSK9s, they may not, there may not be 
as many of them as people think, and we may actually want to be able to work on common variants. Sorry. Well, I think I think the, the, it's, a, it's a very good question. So the, the common rare variants, it, it doesn't immediately strike people as that big of a difference, like you, know, you have a certain amount of variance in genome, what's the difference between the common and rare variants? But they're really very different in, in, in when you really think about them kind of analytically. And the, th the reason is that in common variants, um, first of all, you have this problem much of LD that you don't really have as much with um, rare variants. And the, uh, and the LD problem is a whole different problem. It has to do with the fact that, you know, the, the, that the variant that you might be, see associated with a particular trait, um, it, it's in linkage with a whole bunch of other variants. And so you have this kind of sub-problem of asking which of those in that pool of variants is really the functional problem. And, that, and that's a separate, really a very different problem than the problem with rare variants where there's much less an idea that these, these rare variants are kind of all in LD or something like that. And so that, that's it's just a very separate problem. And then I think the idea is that in a, if you have a common variant, just by definition, if you have a variant that occurs in 30 percent of the people in this room, it's not going to be doing anything that dramatic because there's, there, well, 30 percent of people in the room are living. They're happy people. And so, you know, it, it, I, I think that looking for things that have very large function, functional impact, you're probably not going to see them as much with um, common variants. And I think the mindset is if you want to see the stronger biological effect of the variant, um, you're much better hunting in, um, you know, uh, very rare variants, whether it's a somatic variant in the cancer genome or a rare variant in the Mendelian disease. That's where you're really going to see the impact. And, you know, some, the, the extreme of this, this mindset is that, you know, a lot of people really want to look at rare variants because that's where, um, you know, they imagine they're going to see the, the clearest connection with the biology. You know, you're not going to see it in the 5 percent change from one variant, you know, to another, um, you know, and for, say, a common thing, but you're, you're going to see a whole gene knocked out, or you're going to see a very dramatic effect, and that's where it's easier to uh, get good footing. Um, that's, and, and so I think it is, a, I, I really do think it's some, a somewhat different mindset. I mean, I'm sure some people might argue with me on this, but I, and I think the challenge is, you know, if you want to look at these rare variants, I mean, the, the challenge is numbers, right? So the big thing, the, the game here is, you know, 1,000 genomes pretty much with 25, you know, 100 people did a really nice catalog of fairly common variants. And, you know, if you're only interested in common variants, you can just kind of take, you know, <laughs> close down shop and we're done, we're done with genetics. You know, if you want to look at these rare variants, you know, now you're into this game of we want to look at millions of people because if we look at a million people, we're going to get a gargantuan number of rare variants, and a few people are going to have that really strange variant that might be interesting and so forth. And so it's a, I think that the numbers are the big thing for the rare things. Uh, thank you. Uh, is this one? <laughs> Thank you for a very crisp and clean talk. I truly enjoyed it. I was um, particularly interested in the FUNSEQ that you have mentioned. And if you could perhaps speak to some metrics of success in um, wet lab validation of the mutations that were singled out by FUNSEQ? Sure. Well, there's two, there's sort of two, um, there, there's sort of a number, with it, there's a number of types of validation you can do. Um, I, I mean, the the specific uh, validation we did um, for the cancer variants is you can take that variant and you can look at it in a number of contexts. I mean, you can, you know, with, say, CRISPR or a variety of techniques, you can instantiate that variant in a particular cell in the laboratory and see if that variant has any um, uh, impact or something like that on transcription or transcription factor binding. Um, you can also um, Look at that uh, variant also in a you know a more in vivo type of uh, setting too to see if it um, has any impact. And then of course I think the other thing is if you know if you're looking at a particular um, variant that you really think is very impactful, say I'm making it up in prostate cancer, you know it's a much easier game to go to thousands of people and just sequence that one variant and look for that one thing and test for that one. Uh, type of thing to see if there's some form of um, association. Thank you. I was wondering more uh, along the same lines, how many iterations, if any, did you need to run? Let's say you identify a variant, you go through the steps you have described, and it turns out that 
it, it wasn't what the program predicted. So I was more curious about how many iterations, on average, would you take to come to a conclusion that you? Well, no, that's a good question. I mean, I mean, in this particular context, we didn't iterate, but I, I've thought about this process and actually. Um, now, just let's stay within the purely molecular terms. So you could imagine a situation where you find a variant, or you, uh, you say this is a key variant, and it should affect binding, or it should affect expression of the downstream gene, and you test it, and it does or doesn't. Now, um, the, you can go farther. You can actually do that on a large scale now with a number of these um, assays like StarSeq and so forth, and you can then imagine actually feeding that back into your prediction scheme and reparameterizing the scheme and then redoing it. And that's something we're really quite interested in doing, and actually that's like a current um, thing that we're working on now. We weren't able to do that in the past, but now I think with these um, uh, medium throughput assays like the StarSeq and um, I think there's the massively parallel reporter assay, MPRA, uh, you can start to think about uh, really doing this many times. And so we're, we, we're very interested in iterating this process, though we haven't done that yet. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, usually, um, functional variants are under negative selection. And you can uh, find them, detect them, uh, studying selection, and see that the uh, frequencies are low, et cetera, et cetera. But it's very interesting to find variants which are under positive selection. And can you a uh, little bit comment on this positive selection and differentiate uh, po uh, variants which uh, associated with some, uh, again, positive selection, some development, and those which are under negative selection, both in cancer and in population? Sure. Uh, no, I mean, that's very interesting. Well, let me talk about the second thing in population. So certainly um, in the previous um, results we presented in the, in, in the framework of 1,000 GMs, we were certainly interested to look for regions of, the, regions of the genome that were under positive selection. And I think that's extremely interesting to look at, um, you know, to look at regions that um, are evolving differently in different populations and, you know, which maybe are related to some phenotypes. I think the issue there is just statistics. I mean, I think it's hard, I mean, it, to get good enough statistics to try to look at like a, um, a transcription factor binding site, you really need more people in bigger populations. And we, we did look at um, regions of the genome or annotations that differ significantly, and I, I think the statistic is called FST, uh, between different populations. It's very, the, the, there's not that many you're going to find in, um, from the sample size as large as 1,000 GMs. Now, of course, in the future, with millions of people sequenced in different population groups, and you can group them up, I, I do think that's a very, um, a, a very good avenue to go on. On, um, on. Now, positive selection has a slightly different connotation in cancer. In cancer, people usually use the term positive selection in the way I was talking about it in terms of recurrence and burden. So the mindset is that the certain mutations are positively selected um, because they promote tumor growth, and those are the mutations actually that we're directly finding in larva and so forth. So larva actually in the cancer lingo is looking for pos regions of positive selection. That's actually what it's doing. Though I personally don't like that terminology because it, I find it a little confounded with how people talk about positive selection in a population level. But yes, it, it, that's what larva does. Uh, regarding allelic uh, expression, uh, you talked about using the sequencing data where you can see the two alleles. Uh, but there's also, of course, you can get data from looking at just expression levels irrespective of the alleles and correlating that with having the genotype information. And so I'm wondering, have you started to put those things together? Can there be good synergy? Um, is one much better than the other in terms of um, elucidating these uh, different allele-specific effects? Sure. No, that's a great question. In fact, there's a particular question because one of my interactions with Pamela, and actually one thing that I've been keen to talk to her about, is th that exact thing you're talking about. So let me be precise. One calculation that's very common to do, um, in fact, more common than the allele calculation, actually, is the EQTL calculation. And that's the calculation where you're essentially doing a correlation across population between variants and expression levels. Now, that, look, there's some differences between that and the allele calculation. One of the key differences is that variation can really, again, only easily be done in terms of common variants. So EQTLs are usually going to be, again, common variants that are going to have smaller effects, whereas 
The allele calculation, I think, is set up so that on the individual that you're looking at, if you have that functional genomics data and you have a rare variant that has a big effect, you will see it. I, I, so I think, I, I do think it's, again, this rare and common thing. I think that the eQTL calculations are very powerful and they give you variants, but again, mostly they're going to give you common variants um, associated with um, non-dramatic changes in um, expression level or binding, whereas I think the allele calculations have the potential in the individual, if you sequence them, to see more dramatic changes. I mean, there's no question that you can, you can get more dramatic changes, but you also have the problem of, of so many artifacts that can... Well, no, the allele calculations are very technical. Yeah. You're complete. Well, so, so is the EQGL for that matter, too. I mean, they're very, very technical calculations. And I didn't go into the technical stuff, but there's a deep, deep technical world to go into. And so in particular, the technical world is there's this issue of reference bias. That's a tremendous thing. And so what we actually do and what we're very keen on is this thing we'll call the personal genome approach, where we instantiate actually the maternal and paternal genomes and you actually map to them, and you can actually see in a very complicated way that you'll, that you'll map evenly to those things. And, and then there's, uh, there's also the bugaboo that we talked about with the um, larva calculation of uh, the probability distributions become highly over-dispersed because a lot of the, um, the variants that do have some correlation between them because you do still, have, still have, I mean, you can get allelic calls on common variants, and so you have to deal with the highly over-dispersed uh, distributions. Well, there's a lot of very, very technical stuff. But the long and short of it is, conceptually, it's for sure you can find um, variants that show allelic effects. Are there any other questions? Oh, go ahead, Andrew. So um, this is, I think, maybe not a very complicated question, but um, have you, have you, did you say have you done work trying to extend FunSeq to cancer genomes? And I mean, in general, the problem of going from a, practically, uh, in a longitudinal monitoring of a cancer genome population, which I tend to find model like an infectious disease, you've got a background of inherited mutations, um, and then you've got somatic mutations that are benign, and then somatic mutations that respond and stress over time. So have you thought a little bit about just integrative modeling of all of those? Um, Sure. Well, I mean, I think the cancer genome context is, is, you know, a lot of people find it, it of course, cancer is a very, very nasty disease, obviously. But it is, from a, a modeling perspective, very interesting to people because it, um, there's this notion of evolution, and it's, which is, I think, you're getting, you've got this yeah. uh, germline genome that you're given. And the germline genome certainly um, can set you up in different ways, depending on the variant you have towards, um, towards cancer. And then you have the, the evolution process of the tumor, right? And you have this mindset that in that process, uh, you have random mutations. You have random mutations that are caused by biased processes, such, for instance, if you have a messed up mismatch repair enzyme that will bias you to a certain types of And then you have driving mutations that are actually deranging the whole process. And, you know, how those all come together is actually um, uh, interesting. And, and people are very interested in this. I'm certainly interested in this. I mean, FunSeq um, doesn't take so much a temporal perspective, yeah. but definitely a lot of the cancer analysis now, you know, if you have these samples, is taking that process. I mean, obviously, if you looked at a, if you looked at the evolution of a cancer, you'd have a lot of keys right there for in terms of what um, is driving the cancer versus what's kind of being carried along as a passenger. Right. So I'm, I'm trying to argue a little bit by analogy for some of the infectious disease work we've done, where if you look at so if your question, for instance, is evolution of antibiotic resistance or virulence or whatever, in theory, all you need to do is get you know, the change from time A to time B. Um, and certainly a lot of the clinical testing that's being done in cancer is basically, uh, if, if your goal is to try and manage cancer therapy, is, you know, monitoring key mutations uh, over time and trying to manage it just like an antibiotic stewardship program, essentially. Um, but at the same time, um, trying to actually understand the mechanism by which a given phenotype evolves has a lot to do with the existing prior state. Uh, and I'm not aware of a whole lot of very systematic work in trying to go from, okay, here we have an assembled genome, uh, cancer genome, bacterial genome, whatever it is, to making some predictions about first what its phenotype is now, and then what its trajectory would be to a more pathogenic phenotype, to couple to with the data that people are starting to get clinically, which is the, 
okay, we're monitoring something, a very, no, very small number of things longitudinally over time, looking at the ones we think are important, but ignoring the rest. Well, that's, that's certainly an interesting question. I mean, I, personally, I haven't worked on that exact question, but I do think there, there is a community of people that is, um, does work on cancer genome evolution, and they do think about things certainly like what you're talking about, you know, the sort of state you're in. Now, the other thing that makes cancer a little bit more different from infectious disease is there's this mindset of um, at any given time, you have different mutational processes. So like, for instance, there's a mutational process that's operating my genome now, but if you screw my genome up, it will change the mutational process. And so that, so, th so watching that mutational process change and the random mutations arising from the change mutational process is actually quite interesting. And I, I think people are very interested in, you know, how drugs are going to impact on this and, you know, recurrence and um, resistance. And, you know, I, I think it's a very ripe area that, you know, there's a lot of interest in. Um, so I mean, the reason I asked the view of those specifically, I mean, to the extent that you're doing a better job than average uh, in terms of trying to understand the nature of a genome at ground state, uh, and the interesting question of how well you can predict where it is likely to go or how it could go, which is sort of an inherited cancer susceptibility thing, or how the actual cancer might evolve, is it's an interesting question, right? And trying to, trying to actually figure out how to couple the best prediction for what we have is to, you know, a damaged or non-damaged genome up front is... I think sure. Well, I mean, just just to finish this question, but I'll just say that I mean, I, I'm very interested. I mean, the I mean the the fantasy that people have. I mean, I don't know. Maybe people in this some people in this room are working on this fantasy, or the fantasy, of course, is that you know you're gonna we're gonna be when a person comes in for cancer, we're not gonna sequence their genome once. We're gonna sequence it just constantly throughout their <laughs> therapy, and we'll we'll see, you know, the emergence of resistance. You know, what I'm saying we'll see new subclones that appear that have different mutational patterns, and then the idea would be that you would, you know, pick out a drug, you know, for those things and, you know, sort of target them right there. That's, of course, the fantasy. I mean, I, I think it, it, I mean, it, it does make some sense, and people are definitely interested in that. Probably pick out four drugs to make sure that you actually can, because it takes three to block HIV, right, and it's a smaller genome, so. Uh, four. Four or five. All right, well, thank you. Thank you.